Well, folks, the new leftist litmus test appears to be whether or not you're willing to deny biology, truth, and reality in order to appease the very vocal and very militant minority. The latest victim of all of this, rocker Alice Cooper, who, when specifically and explicitly asked in an interview with Stereo Gum about gender identity, said the following. Basically, that while he understands that there are true cases of transgenderism, he's concerned it's become a fad and a fad pushed on young kids. Bingo! Nail meets head. But because he dared to speak the truth, outrage, of course. Vampire Cosmetics, whatever that is, cut ties with Cooper over it, posting this before deleting their entire Twitter account. And once again, the same song and dance and the same lie. If you reject the notion that innocent and vulnerable children should be used as pawns in some kind of a trans social experiment, you are denying access to health care. That's a lie. Opposing irreversible and permanent surgical or hormonal changes on minors is not opposition to health care. It's opposition to child abuse. And we need to start coming right out and saying that. Stop tiptoeing, stop negotiating with pedophiles and groomers and child exploiters. We have a duty to confront this nonsense boldly and unapologetically. So stop using their language. Stop cowering in the corner because you're afraid you'll be called anti-trans. Stop letting these people set the rules. We don't play by those rules and we never should have given this radical movement an inch. We should have never coddled it in the first place. You know, if adults want to play these trans games, you know, let them. But the sentiment from all of us should be, over my dead body, will you mess with children? So, Ben, I want to jump right on in to the mugshot seen and heard around the world. Now, the Trump campaign reportedly raising over $7 million since the indictment, the booking, the mugshot was released. So it feels like it's really Teflon Don right now that he's continuing to gain ground. But now we've got an announcement, you know, that these trials are really going to butt up to all the major milestones in the primary and general election season. So what's your take on how this is going to go down? Is it really going to keep helping Trump or is there going to be a point here where maybe it starts to slightly fade away? You know, I think that first off, you know, we've seen a complete sea change from where we were last year in terms of the attitude toward Trump uh, among Republicans. They have become far more invested in him. You know, he obviously has the lead that he's had in national polls and the like. Uh, but a big part of that has been what they view as persecution by this government uh, against him, uh, targeting him in so many different respects. Now, you can argue that he's given them a lot of rope to do that. Uh, and I think that that's a fair argument. It's one certainly that I hold to. But at the same time, I think it's done nothing but help him in the course of this primary. And the idea that you are going to have a sea change among people who feel very strongly that he's being persecuted, targeted, uh, you know, martyred effectively for the cause. I just don't think that's going to change between now and when people start voting. What I do think is going to be interesting, though, is whether these cases and the degree to which they are going to invade the process that is going to play out next year uh, turn into something that Republican voters, but also a lot of right-leaning independents, uh, view as being something that makes him incapable of becoming president again. They don't uh, see it as being something that will help him against Joe Biden, certainly, if you assume that that's still going to be the Democrats' candidate. Uh, and they also, you know, are going to be something that's a distraction, not just when it comes to his time, as you made reference to, but also to his resources, to his money. You know, all that $7 million is going to get eaten up. It's going to get eaten up by all these different lawyers and all these cases that he's having to fight. And I think that that's what Democrats want to do. They want to effectively have him be the nominee and then have him so distracted by all these personal fights that he's incapable of, of you know, running effectively uh, a 2024 presidential campaign. That's a big bet, though. And Democrats have been wrong in the past when they've made similar bets. They were wrong in a number of cases uh, just in this last midterm when they made bets about who, you know, picking people in primaries who actually came very close to winning. And I think that this is another situation where they're running a real risk that by going down this road and participating in this lawfare, they're going to end up promoting someone who they say over and over again, they tell us he's an existential threat <laughs> to the American democracy and the like. Uh, and yet they're going to be the ones, I think, who've helped him win that nomination, assuming things uh, continue on the path that they currently are on. That's what really my concern is on all of this. And, you know, I think that we look at it really one dimensionally when you look on social media. It's either you're a Trumper 
or you're not. You're a Trumper or you're disloyal. You're a rhino, you're a never Trumper. So I think that's a little frustrating because there's a lot of us that exist somewhere in the middle where we're trying to sort all this out and we're a little frustrated. Me personally, I'm frustrated because whereas I would love Trump to be my president again, I've been a longtime Trump supporter, I'm very concerned when I look at national polls and I see 63% of Americans saying that Donald Trump should be indicted four times, when I see Americans reacting that they're very concerned concerned about his legal problems when it comes to a general election and re-electing him, that gives me cause for pause. And I don't know how we ever correct the swamp, the deep state, whatever you want to call it, if we can't win an election. So that's why for me, my eye wanders over to Ron DeSantis, who's actually gotten rid of activist DAs, who's actually effectively drained the swamp to a large extent in Florida. And I look at that and I see, boy, if Ron DeSantis could be our nominee and our president, we could still support Trump and his legal battles and his legacy, but maybe that's the better approach to actually get something done for the American people. But I fear that because there is this circling of the wagons around Trump, that we're not gonna have a chance to get there. And that's where I'm wondering what your thought is, your analysis, are voters gonna change these hardcore immovable Trump voters? Do you think as we get closer that they're gonna be maybe not so willing to take this giant risk? You know, you, what, you're, uh, uh, what you're acknowledging there, Tommy, is really that it's kind of ahistorical for us in America to see so much tied up on a day-to-day -day basis with a politician. I mean, your average American historically didn't feel this way about the leadership of their party. And it's not something that's very natural for us. You know, we, we don't have that kind of tendency as a nation. And I think that one of the things that's really happening is that because of that uh, divisive nature of the former president, we're not even having the kind of conversation that we should be having practically about what we want to see from the next uh, presidency. I mean, one of the reasons that I think you know you should actually consider moving on from Donald Trump, even if you are a Trump supporter, is that he's only able to serve one more term. It's going to take a lot more than one term to fix the problems that we have in this country, and particularly the problems that have been accelerated under Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And you know, the other thing that really makes me concerned is that for all these Republicans who care about winning, they seem blind to the fact that the Democrats haven't even started running ads against Trump yet, and he still has those numbers. Mm -hmm. He still has those negative numbers. You can see national polls where he's tied with Joe Biden right now, but they haven't even started going after him in the way that they're going to, in the way that we, we always see the machine come uh, and, and move against somebody who they really hate. And that's not just the deep state. It's not just the Biden administration. It's their allies, the media. It's their allies in culture and in pop culture. It's going to be everything, just you know, throwing everything that they can to keep Donald Trump from getting back to the White House because they hate not just him, but everyone, everyone who you know feels that he represents them. All the voters out there who were, you know, wanted to send a shock to the system, a message to the system back in 2016. But there are certain hard, true facts about the way that the electorate has changed. In 2016, more than half of voters were people who were born before the uh, year 1965. What we're looking at right now in terms of the predictions from some of the smartest pollsters, analysts out there, is that we're looking at an electorate going into this coming year that's going to have as perhaps as low as 40% of the electorate be born before 1965, and a third of it is going to be born after 1980. Winning a lot of those millennial voters winning younger voters, people uh, who have concerns now uh, that are just coming to the fore in terms of what they're seeing going on in our schools, what they're seeing in terms of the woke agenda that DeSantis has been targeting in Florida. Speaking to those concerns, I think, is going to be of paramount importance in terms of charting this new direction for the Republican Party and winning over voters uh, who they frankly need in this new coalition. I'm not sure that the former president can do that. Speaking of Ron DeSantis, you know, I think that his campaign got off to a bumpy start. I think he's doing better now, but I think part of the problem with Ron DeSantis is he has so many advisors, he's listening to so many people, that sometimes he ignores his natural instincts because I think at the debate last week was a perfect example. I think someone told him, like, 
Smile, smile as much as you can. Make yourself look normal. Make yourself look pleasant. Make yourself look chill. And I think he got in his own head about it. And that's when he comes off awkward to me is when he's trying so hard. But it was actually Matt Walsh that posted last week. And I thought it was incredibly spot on. He said what Ron DeSantis needs to do is he needs to come onto that next debate stage and say, listen, I'm not your homecoming king. I'm not Mr. Charisma. I'm kind of a nerd. I'm kind of awkward. <laughs> but I'm kind of an awkward nerd who loves this country and get stuff done. So if you're looking for someone to get stuff done, I'm your guy. But I'm wondering if he can get over that hump because he from the out the gate has been riddled with issues because they've been labeling him disloyal since before he announced. But do you think that he can pick up some steam and actually give Trump a run for his money at this point? You know what? I really think he can. And one of the reasons I think he can is actually because of that debate performance because I think you saw in it, hey, wait a minute. If you weren't someone who's super online, paying attention to everything that's happening within a campaign, who's in charge, who's getting listened to, that type of thing, I think that you would see that performance and say, this guy seems fine. It doesn't seem like, you know, what's what's the, the idea that there's some sort of uh, falling apart or anything like that? It just doesn't, it didn't come across that way to me. I also think that one of the things that's so fundamental about this is that was a debate that I felt like played to a, a number of his strengths. The thing that made him so popular in Florida was not so much the stuff that gets national play in terms of his fight with Disney or things like that. It was a lot of it was kitchen table issues. It was, you know, him fighting to make sure that it was cheaper for families to be able to afford the different things, you know, strollers and diapers and everything that they needed to take care of kids, a, a kind of pro-family agenda that he had at the state level that really gained him a, a ton of popularity and helped him turn, you know, a state that was certainly, uh, you know, blue at one point, purple for a long time. It's now deep red. Uh, and that's because of his policies. I think that People want to be able to have confidence that there's someone who's not just going to fight for them, but who's going to be able to actually deliver. And I think that your point is, is well taken, uh, making it clear to people, hey, if you want someone who's actually going to deliver on, on these promises, who's not just going to make you feel good because of a tweet or yelling about something, but someone who actually does something, then I'm your guy. I do, too. And I think that's his strong suit. I, I think he could perform so well in a general election. I have a lot of confidence in him. But I think there's something else that's kind of standing in his way, and I want to get, uh, finally, your take on Vivek. So he is the media darling right now. I think it was today he was on TMZ. I mean, he's a little bit of everywhere. He's very well-spoken. I've worked with him before in, in the building at 1211 on Outnumbered. I think he's a great guy. I think he says a lot of the right things. But as this is playing out to me, I feel like he's doing this more for attention and more to be a shock jock and get that media time than he is because he actually thinks he can win. And there's part of me that also feels like he's kind of just running cover for Donald Trump and keeping Ron DeSantis out of the way. But what's your take on him? Are you impressed? Well, on the one hand, I'm impressed by the arguments that I heard from him before he was running for president. I've interviewed him several times on my own podcast. You know, I certainly, you know, share with you feelings that he's a very smart guy uh, and very capable of defending uh, conservative ideas, some libertarianish ideas and the like, which I certainly appreciate. At the same time, I feel like he's one of these people who really is just like a media figure. He he wants to tell people what they want to hear. And a lot of the time, I think people, you know, they're they're uh, very sympathetic to the idea that the existing political structure is corrupt and stupid and wrong. And they're they're right to feel that way. But the response to that can't just be to call that out. You have to actually offer an alternative. I think with Vivek, unfortunately, a lot of the alternatives that he offers are just an inch deep in terms of his response to things. Just this weekend, he you know went on uh, on Meet the Press and was explaining what he would have done differently than Mike Pence. And he ran through a list of things that, man, I mean, it would be nice if you could just do that as vice president, but that's not the way the Constitution works. It's not the way the law works. All the different changes he wanted to make with the way that people would vote and the like. It's completely speculative, and it's the kind of thing that you hear from pundits who aren't very good at their jobs or who don't particularly care about whether the ideas they're throwing out there are workable or not. And frankly, I find that to be very irritating at any level of government, but certainly on the stage where you're contending to be commander in chief. So for those reasons, I really discount Vivek. I think that he's a flash in the pan candidate. And I think that once people start digging into and paying attention to the actual ramifications of his ideas, I think that they'll see that there's just not a lot of there there. Uh, and, you know, people have compared him, obviously, Chris Christie, who I'm no fan of, compared him to chat GPT. But I do think he's kind of like, 
putting uh, just putting questions out there, you know, your Ask Jeeves candidate or what have you, you know, where you turn to the AI and you say, just spit out something that I can use. But we know that that doesn't work for book reports, and it certainly doesn't work for policy at the, at the, the level of government that he's aspiring to. Yeah, there's not a lot of policy there. A lot of talk, a lot of things that sound good, and he delivers it well, but I think you're right about that. He just says things and people believe it because there is a certain segment of the Republican Party that does just believe that these things can be absolved overnight and then he could just be the quick fix and they don't realize all the red tape that regardless if you like red tape or not, you do have to go through. The Constitution being one of those things, it's very important. Ben, thank you as always for your analysis. I really appreciate it. And uh, we will just have to wait and see how this all goes down. Great to be with you.